Hello students, welcome to Baiju's classes. In the beginning of the week, RBI announced that uh, henceforth uh, stringent norms will be applicable for uh, the large scale borrowers whose accounts have become non-performing assets. Apart from this, RBI also announced that it will be withdrawing uh, schemes uh, such as uh, SDR as well as S4A. So basically, this particular week, uh, the discussion should have been centered around uh, the large scale implications of uh, these reforms which have been introduced by RBI. But rather than uh, being focused on this, uh, the center of discussion has become uh, the Punjab National Bank, which has got embroiled uh, in uh, one of the largest scams uh, or the corporate scams in uh, independent India. The scale of the scam is so huge uh, that it has been said that uh, this will be much, much bigger than uh, Vijay Malaya scenario or Kingfisher case uh, and uh, the number of uh, banks which will be taken into or number of banks which will be affected uh, with the spillover effects uh, will be much, much higher than the Kingfisher case. So what is this particular case that I am speaking of? Uh, what are the concepts involved in it? What was the actual uh, outcome of it? Or what has been uh, the situation involved in this particular scenario? And uh, what are the laws which have been broken? Uh, or what are the procedures or the guidelines which have been violated uh, in this particular scenario? We'll have a look at uh, all the discussions. Uh, in this particular slide, you can basically see the headlines of uh, various news channels as well as the newspapers in the last couple of days. Uh, and these uh, have become uh, the center of discussion in the last four or five days. Uh, so the areas of discussion in this particular video will be, one, we will discuss what are the basic concepts uh, which are involved uh, in this particular uh, area or in this particular case, uh, that is uh, the concept of LOU, which has become the epicenter of this particular discussion, that is a letter of undertaking, which is also referred as a letter of credit. Apart from this, uh, some of the other issues or the concepts which have uh, become the epicenters or the surrounding this particular LOC are uh, concept of a SWIFT. We will have a look at some of the basic concepts uh, or basic uh, points regarding SWIFT. CBS, core banking solutions, what is the idea of a CBS? What is the application of CBS? Uh, and in what way CBS is related to the topic in the hand? Apart from this, uh, the accounts which are called as a Nostro and Vostro accounts, uh, we will have a look at these particular concepts. Apart from this, uh, we will also have a look at uh, what should be the ideal situation which should have been followed by all the participants or the stakeholders which are involved uh, in this particular case. And uh, compared to the ideal situation, what was the actual uh, practice which was followed? Uh, in what way it is different? And what are the guidelines which have been broken uh, when this particular situation uh, was followed? Now, uh, apart from this, we'll have a discussion regarding what is the magnitude of this particular scam. Again, having said so, this particular magnitude or the points under magnitude are basically focused on uh, the information that has been provided uh, so far. And as the time passes by and the investigative agencies uh, keep on unearthing certain new facts, uh, this magnitude either might increase or might become smaller. But all the expectations are that the magnitude or the scale of this particular scam will be much, much bigger and it will engulf many of the public sector banks as well as the private sector banks in the coming days. Apart from this, we'll also have a look at the repercussions of this particular scam. And finally, what is a way out or what are the recommendations which the government of India or even the banking sector can basically take into account to ensure that this kind of a scheme or this kind of a scam does not happen or recur in the future. Let's start with the first concept that is LOC, which stands for letter of credit. The letter of credit is basically an instrument or a document which is issued by a bank on behalf of a buyer guaranteeing the payment to the seller. Now to understand this particular concept, let's take up an example. Let's assume there is a company X which wants to buy goods or raw materials worth 10,000 rupees from a company Y. Now this particular company X, let's assume holds an account in a bank ABC. Now bank ABC, since it knows the credit worthiness of a company X, will issue a letter of credit to company Y stating that this particular company X will make the payment of 10,000 rupees. If not, it will be paid by this particular bank that is ABC. So basically in this particular transaction, we can see that the bank guarantees the payment to the seller on behalf of the buyer. These instruments which are very famous or which are very frequently used in the market are called as a letter of credit. Now let's look at the concept of a SWIFT. 
SWIFT basically stands for Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. SWIFT basically stands for a particular platform or a digital platform using which the communication will be transferred from one international bank to another international bank or amongst banks which are situated or located in different countries. The concept of a SWIFT is often used whenever a domestic bank wants to transfer certain funds into a bank which is outside India or else if a bank which is situated outside India wants to transfer certain funds into a bank or a branch which is situated in India. So basically the SWIFT transactions are also called as a wire transactions or wire transfers and the SWIFT codes which are basically in the form of either 8 digits or 11 digit alphanumeric codes are very much often used for wire transfers between the banks which are situated across the borders. Apart from this, certain points which could be asked in the prelims in this particular year related to the SWIFT concept itself is 1. It was established in the year 1973. To begin with, it was basically used for the concept of a transmission of a communication amongst the banks. Over a period of time, the messages which have been transmitted in this particular platform across all the banks which are situated across the borders has kept on increasing at an exponential rate. In the year 1995, it was said that the messages which were transferred on daily basis on this particular platform were to the tune of around 2.4 million, which today in the year 2015 stood at over 24 million messages on daily basis. So basically the concept of a SWIFT or the platform of a SWIFT is being used very efficiently or at a very frequent pace in the recent days. Apart from this, it is used to transmit financial information and it, the headquarters of SWIFT is located in Belgium. It has also got the offices at various locations across various countries in the world. Now let's have a look at the concept of core banking solutions, which is also referred as CBS. Now previously, if I opened an account in a particular branch of a bank, basically I was a customer of a branch. But with the introduction of the concept of a CBS, that is a core banking solutions, now I become a customer of a bank rather than being just a customer of a branch. Now what is this concept of a, right, being a customer of a bank rather than being a customer of a branch? Now basically the idea is this, with the introduction of a core banking solutions, now I can conduct the banking transaction across all the branches of the same bank across India. That is if I want to deposit money, I could do in any of the bank branch in any of the part of India. That is specifically which is right under this particular bank. Let's assume I have got an account in ICICI bank or SBI bank. Now previously I used to or I was forced to conduct the banking transaction under this particular branch of this particular bank. But with the introduction of CBS, that is core banking solution, I can conduct the same transactions across all the branches of either SBI or ICICI bank across India. This has been the revolutionary technology or revolutionary reform or a policy which has been implemented across the banking branches in India as well as across the world, which has led to higher number of transaction or ease of banking as such. Now some of the software solutions which will provide the core banking solution for the banking sector in case of India are uh, the Finacle which has been developed by Infosys and it is uh, the software uh, or it is the CBS uh, which has been used by the Punjab National Bank. Apart from this, uh, two more software solutions which are available for core banking solutions are uh, Banks and uh, iFlex solution. Banks has been developed by TCS and iFlex solution has been developed by Oracle. Now previously it was called as iFlex solution but recently it has been renamed as the Oracle Financial Services. So basically these are some of the CBS which are available for the banking sector and presently the bank which is in the epicenter of this particular scam that is a Punjab National Bank uses a Finacle CBS. In the last couple of days various newspapers have carried this particular statement which basically reads like this. The Hong Kong branches of Allahabad Bank, Access Bank and various other banks have transferred funds into the Nostra account of Punjab National Bank. And since they have transferred the funds into the Nostra account of Punjab National Bank, they seek the repayment on these particular transfers. Now question arises, what is the idea of a Nostra account? 
In this particular slide, I will have a discussion regarding uh, two concepts. One is a Nostra account and Ostra account. The probability of a question being asked in prelims uh, based on Nostra account or Ostra account uh, will become very higher since uh, this particular terminology has been mentioned uh, very often in the last couple of days in the newspapers. Now, let us look at uh, the concept of a Nostra and Ostra account. To explain this, uh, I have taken up an example, a simple example. And uh, in this particular example, let us assume uh, here is a, a Indian company X and it wants to buy certain goods or services uh, from a foreign company Y. But to buy this particular goods or services, it has to make uh, certain payments uh, and for sake of understanding, let us assume this particular foreign company is uh, located in USA and since it is an Indian company, it is situated in India. Now, Indian company has got the reserves or the money in the form of a rupee but the payment to the foreign company has to be paid in uh, in terms of dollars. Basically, the concept of a Nostra account will be used uh, in this particular scenario. Let us assume this particular Indian company has got an account uh, with this particular bank A and the bank A does not have any branches uh, in the country USA. As a result of which, uh, basically it will enter into an agreement and open uh, an account uh, with uh, a branch of uh, Indian bank which is present in USA or else it will open an account with a branch of American bank in USA. This particular bank or this particular account that I am referring to basically is denominated in terms of dollars. Now, so for sake of understanding, I have assumed this particular bank B to be let us say an Indian bank or Indian banking branch which is present in case of USA. Now, bank A will open an account in this particular branch of bank B and the denomination of uh, this particular account uh, will be in terms of dollars. This uh, bank account which has been opened by bank A which is an Indian bank uh, in foreign nation uh, and the denomination being in terms of dollars uh, is called as a Nostro account. Again I will repeat it, this particular bank account which has been opened uh, by an Indian bank uh, in a branch of uh, either an Indian bank in foreign country or else uh, a foreign bank in a foreign country is called as a Nostro account. Nostro as a term comes from a Latin language. The basic meaning of a Nostro means ours. Since it is a bank account which has been opened by an Indian bank in foreign country, this will be referred as a Nostro account and it will be denominated in the foreign currency. Now, when I speak from perspective of Indian bank, this account becomes Nostro account. And when I speak regarding the same account from perspective of a bank B, it will be referred as Ostro account or Ostro account. Now, please understand I am speaking from perspective of the same account, but the context keeps on changing. First, I am referring to this particular bank account from perspective of a bank A, which is an Indian bank. And in this particular scenario, it will be referred as a Nostro account and it will be denominated in a foreign currency itself. And in the second scenario, I am saying the account has to be looked at from perspective of uh, the foreign bank or the branch of uh, Indian bank which is present in foreign country. From that perspective, it will be referred as Ostro account. Now, what is the ideal usage of a Ostro or Nostro account? I said the Indian company that is company X wants to buy goods uh, from company Y which is uh, present in case of USA. Let us say the payment uh, has to be $100. Now, rather than paying or getting the rupees exchanged in terms of dollars, basically Indian company will ask this particular bank to open a Nostro account here and get the loan from this particular bank and make the payment of $100 to this particular foreign company. Advantage of this kind of a transaction is that the volatility in terms of foreign exchanges will be overcome by opening a Ostro account or a Nostro account in foreign branches. So, this is a basic idea of functioning of a Nostro or Ostro account. Now, let us try and understand what should have been the ideal situation or if all the guidelines were followed, what kind of transaction should have happened. That is the ideal or the legal usage of a letter of credit or letter of undertaking. Now, please understand although the term letter of undertaking I have not explained it, letter of undertaking is as good as the concept of a letter of credit itself. Now, what should have been the ideal situation or if all the guidelines were met, what should have been the procedure which should have been followed. 
Now let's assume to understand the situation again I have taken a simple example. I have taken an Indian bank and Indian company and a overseas branch of an Indian bank and a foreign company. So basically the ideal situation is that if the Indian company wants to buy certain goods or services from a foreign company and it wants to basically hedge the risk payments in terms of volatility of a forex reserves, it will basically seek a letter of credit or a letter of undertaking from bank A. Now this particular bank A will issue the letter of credit or letter of undertaking using which the Indian company will take the loan from bank B which is a overseas branch of an Indian bank itself. Apart from this, there are certain points or checkpoints which have been situated or which have been inserted into this particular system. Now basically understand this, whenever bank A which is an issuer bank issues an LOC or an LOU, it has to transfer this particular information to this particular overseas branch through the concept of a SWIFT that is a messaging service. It has to transfer the message and apart from this, this particular issuer bank has also to ensure that this value of LOC is recorded in the core banking solution. Basically, it has to record in its books or account books so that the balancing will be maintained. So before this LOC is provided or LOU is provided, the bank A will basically seek either credit margin or else it will decide what is the credit limit which will be given for this particular company or Indian company X. Usually 100% of the credit margin is sought that is in a sense before issuing the LOU itself the value of the LOU is collected by the bank in the form of a collateral. So once it has been issued and the message has been transferred through SWIFT and this account or this particular value of LOU is entered into CBS, the bank B will provide a loan to Indian company X through Nostro account and this particular Indian company X will make a payment to the foreign company and in turn will receive either the goods or services from this particular foreign company. This is the ideal situation or ideal scenario under which all the guidelines are being followed by all the stakeholders. And once this particular transaction is over, what is the utility of LOU and what is the use of LOU here? Once this LOU has been issued, the maturity period or the tenure of LOU usually is for a period of 90 days or for a period of 3 months. Once this time period of 3 months is over, bank B will present this LOU to bank A and the bank A has to honor whatever is the value of the loan amount or the value of LOU plus the interest amount. This is the ideal situation or the ideal scenario which has to be maintained and by maintaining this particular following this particular practice all the guidelines which have been established by RBI will be followed. Now having looked at what should be the ideal scenario, let's try and understand what actually happened in case of Punjab National Bank. Three companies, Diamond Saras, Solar Exports and Stellar Diamonds basically approached one of the branches of Punjab National Bank. The low level officials who were working in this particular branch issued the letter of credit or letter of undertaking without collecting any kind of a collateral from this particular companies. Now these companies use these letter of credits or letter of undertakings to get the loans from overseas branches of some of the Indian banks such as Allahabad Bank, Union Bank, Axis Bank and State Bank of India. Now basically the ideal situation whenever these letter of undertakings or LOUs are issued by bank A, it has to provide the information to these overseas branches by using the system of SWIFT. Now whenever these LOUs are issued, the bank that is a issuer bank in this particular scenario, Punjab National Bank has to transmit the message or give the financial related information to this particular overseas branch through the SWIFT system which was done by these officials and also enter the value of LOUs in the core banking solution that is basically into the bank accounts. The officials it is stated that they transmitted the message or transfer the message to various overseas branches of Indian banks regarding the issuance of LOUs but they did not enter the value of these LOUs in the bank accounts. As a result of which 
after seven years, uh, when the bank officials uh, tried to find out uh, these kind of transactions uh, in the core banking solution systems, uh, they were unable to find these particular transaction. In essence, uh, Punjab National Bank has issued uh, crores worth of LOUs uh, and has guaranteed the repayment uh, on these crores worth of LOUs. Uh, but the higher officials of Punjab National Bank uh, does not even have any kind of information regarding this. Uh, and this particular practice has gone on for uh, more than seven years. Uh, and this particular issue is shocking for a simple reason. It is not the first time that this kind of a situation has happened in case of Punjab National Bank. It was also involved in the same kind of a situation couple of years ago with respect to again a diamond trader itself uh, regarding which CBI conducted the investigation and filed the reports only in the last one year. So basically this is not the first time that uh, the situation has arisen or the security breach has happened uh, in Punjab National Bank. And this is not the first time that uh, this kind of a situation has also happened uh, in Indian banks. Um, so basically this particular scam was not unearthed or was not revealed for the last seven years uh, which is more shocking for a simple reason at various stages uh, or various time periods there will be audits which are conducted and to understand or to consume uh, this kind of an information that uh, more than 11,000 crore rupees uh, was basically not found on the balance sheet uh, is very much shocking as well as surprising. So there is no doubt that uh, this scam will have large scale repercussions on the whole Indian banking system. Whatever the size of uh, the losses which will be incurred by the Punjab National Bank, uh, we will only understand after the investigation is done. But nevertheless, uh, the security loopholes or the breaches uh, or the violation of various guidelines uh, are an alarming bell for the whole Indian banking system. For a simple reason, uh, no doubt PNB has uh, dismissed around 10 officials. Uh, but what was the role of uh, the other banks or the other stakeholders which are present in these kind of transactions? The banks such as Allahabad Bank, Access Bank and State Bank of India, why did they basically keep on by default uh, changing the tenure period or revamping uh, or readjusting the tenure period of uh, yellow yoza uh, and why did they not inform uh, the higher officials of the Punjab National Bank? So basically it will have a large scale repercussions uh, on the Indian banking system. Before understanding the repercussions or the various uh, effects that it will have on the Indian banking system, let's try and understand the magnitude of uh, the scam. Having said so, again a reminder, uh, whatever values I'm assuming here is based on uh, the values which have been provided in the newspaper. And uh, initially if you have seen uh, Punjab National Bank when they filed the first information report, uh, they basically said that there was a scam or the fraudulent uh, transactions are worth only 280 crores which has snowballed into more than 11,000 crores and with the passage of the time many more banks or many more branches of many of these particular banks may come out with these kind of fraudulent practices and the size of this particular scam or other scams which might be unearthed the magnitude of it might be much much higher. So keeping in mind the information that has been provided so far by the newspapers as well as the Punjab National Bank, uh, let's try and understand what is the magnitude of the scam. Uh, the value of the scam uh, or the fraudulent practices uh, which is more than 11,000 crores uh, in terms of a number that is in terms of a value is uh, basically twice uh, the capitalization that was provided by government of India in the recent financial year. So basically the capitalization that is basically the taxpayers money which was provided by government of India is half of the value of uh, the fraudulent practice or the scam which has happened in Punjab National Bank. Second, uh, this is more than eight times the profit that was reported uh, by Punjab National Bank in the year financial year 17. Now please understand that the public sector banks are already suffering from uh, the effects of a twin balance sheet problem. On one side they are unable to meet uh, the credit requirements of various sectors uh, and on the other side uh, the profit margin has already decreased uh, and in the last uh, three years uh, the return on, on assets uh, or the profits of uh, the public sector banks have already turned into negative or have entered into negative. And in this particular scenario if a particular bank uh, falls into this kind of a scams uh, or is uh, a prey for these particular scams. Uh, it will have a large scale impact on the investment or it will have a large scale impact on investor confidence in this particular bank. And already we have seen that the investors who had invested such as LIC, the shares of LIC have taken a hit, the banking sector shares have taken a hit, the confidence on the diamond traders has already taken a hit. Third, 
the value of the scam is one third the value of a market capitalization of this particular bank. So basically these are in terms of a size of transactions. Second, what does this say about the security of the banking sector? A common man will keep money in the banking sector feeling or presuming that his money will be safe in the hands of a banker. Now if I realize that the bank itself is falling prey for these kind of transactions, what kind of faith will I have on the banking sector? And what does this represent in terms of a security of a banking sector? And what does it say about a particular bank which has fallen prey for the second time in four years for same kind of fraudulent transactions? Third, where were the checks and balances? Because in an ideal situation, I stated that whenever an LOU is issued, the value of the LOU has to be mentioned in the core banking solution that is in the account books of the bank. So why was it not mentioned? And what did PNB do for the last seven years? And why was it not able to find out that a huge amount of money that is in terms of thousands of crores, whereas it is paying, but it is not mentioned in the balance sheet or it is not mentioned in the books of the Punjab National Bank. And why was it not revealed during the auditing process? Because in a particular financial year, a bank will undergo many a times the process of auditing. A bank will have employed the internal auditors as well as external auditors. Apart from this, even RBI will keep on auditing the numbers of the balance sheet of this particular bank. So despite having auditing process done at so many levels, why this kind of a scam was not revealed? So based on this, you can imagine what could be the magnitude of the scam if these kind of transactions have happened in many of the banks. That is the precise reason the finance ministry has asked all the public sector banks as well as the private sector banks to start looking at the transactions in terms of large borrowers or the large creditors and find out if there are any kind of fraudulent transactions which have happened in all the other banks also. So having looked at the magnitude of the scam, let's try and understand what are the repercussions of this particular scam. No doubt. Indian banking sector will be severely hit by this, this particular scam. The diamond traders, jewelry sector will be hit by this particular scam. But I want to start the discussion regarding this with a caveat. The caveat simple is this. Indian banking sector which is helmed or which is regulated by Reserve Bank of India is considered to be one of the most robust banking systems in the world. Indian banking sector was specially held or praised the way it handled the global financial crisis effects. Most of the banking sectors in most of the developed economies buckled under pressure post the GFC. But in case of India, because of prudent norms or the guidelines which have been set up at various points by Reserve Bank of India, the spillover effect experienced by the Indian banking sector was the least. Hence, although this particular banking sector will be affected by this particular scam, we need to remember that Indian banking sector is a prudent, Indian banking sector will get back to stability in coming period. So what are the repercussions of it? Definitely the investor confidence will be hit, especially investor confidence in Punjab National Bank and all the other banks which are involved in this particular transactions. Already we have seen that Punjab National Bank has announced to return to normalcy, it will take anywhere around six months. Not only this, the share values or the market capitalization of Punjab National Bank as well as all the other banks which are involved in these kind of transactions have already fallen down. So basically it will affect the confidence of the investor in the functioning of these particular banks. Second, will the taxpayers or have the taxpayers already been taxed? Because on one side there is an argument that since government of India is a majority stakeholder in these particular banks, government of India has to provide the financial assistance by pumping in capital into the banking sector. But on the other side, there is already an existing argument that the banking sector, especially public sector banks, do not follow the guidelines, do not lend to credit worthy people, as a result of which they may incur the losses. And if they are incurring the losses, what is the use of taking the taxpayers money and giving it to the public sector banks. That is in essence the argument is good money being used for bad purposes. 
So in this particular scenario, when this particular argument is existing, this particular scam has come into light, which will basically dent the argument of providing capital to public sector banks. Third, recently the government of India has introduced a FIDI bill, which contains one of the most contentious provisions called a bail-in provision. Now, what if a Punjab National Bank had crumbled under the pressure because of a higher scam? So, would this particular bank, that is Punjab National Bank, be provided with the bail-in provision? In which particular scenario, the value of the deposits or the depositors would be taking a hit? So, basically the arguments in favor of a bail-in provision will be weakened by exposure of this particular scam. Fourth, the scam basically represents the loopholes which are present in the system. Now, the fact of the matter is anybody who is involved in a lending business will face a risk. It could be an operational risk which could be a credit risk. But being a bank, we assume or presume that it has kept the checks and balances or it has implemented certain policy reforms which will ensure that these kind of risks are reduced and the investor's money that is the depositor's money has got highest security. But in case of Punjab National Bank, which is the second largest lender in case of India, if this bank itself is prone to these kind of fraudulent transactions, then basically it represents gaping loopholes in the banking sector. Fifth, the sectors will fall back into stress. That is both the banking sector as well as the jewelry sector. Banking sector is already under a lot of stress because on one side it has to wipe out the non-performing assets and on the other side it has to meet the credit requirement of industrial sector and the third angle is also that it has to meet the Basel guidelines or Basel 3 provisions by 2019. In this particular scenario, a further stress will be imposed on the banking sector because of these particular fraudulent transactions. Not only this, the jewelry sector which generates uh, around uh, 5 to 6 billion uh, dollars in the form of uh, forex revenues for uh, Indian market or Indian economy will also fall into stress. Now, please understand, uh, it is said that uh, because of these kind of uh, scams, uh, now it will be very difficult for the diamond traders uh, to get uh, yellow use from many of the banks. Uh, for a simple reason, the banks uh, will not uh, have a faith uh, on these kind of a traders uh, or the banks will be wary about uh, the repayment which will be provided by these particular traders. Uh, now finally, what about uh, the debt owed uh, by the companies uh, to the banks? The companies that I am referring to are the companies uh, which are in the epicenter of this particular scam. For example, one of the companies that has been uh, quoted in the FIR is the Geetanjali company. Geetanjali company has got an outstanding debt of more than 5000 crore rupees. What if uh, the repayment is not done? The basic uh, outcome will be the banking sector will be pushed into stress all over again and the non-performing assets of the banking sector will keep on increasing. So these are some of the repercussions uh, right, which will be experienced by various stakeholders uh, who are present in the system. So having looked at the repercussions, uh, what is the way out? What are the reforms uh, which have to be implemented by government of India? to ensure that uh, these kind of uh, transactions or scams uh, do not happen in the future. I have listed out uh, three recommendations uh, and these particular recommendations uh, are long standing demands of uh, various experts uh, who have stated that uh, the government of India needs to implement these reforms. Not only this, various committees which have been set up by government of India over a period of time have recommended uh, these three reforms to be implemented by government of India. So, what are the three reforms I am talking about? One, basically we will have to fix the banking sector, the lending practices of the banking sector, autonomy to the banking sector, the due diligence in case of a banking sector, the stakeholders who are involved in this particular scam should have alerted the officials of the Punjab National Bank long ago. So, where were the gaps, where were the loopholes? Why was the due diligence not conducted in case of uh, these kind of uh, letter of undertakings? And uh, autonomy has to be provided for the banking sector. No doubt uh, in this particular uh, recommendation that uh, autonomy is uh, one of the long standing demand of uh, various uh, experts uh, which the government of India has not yielded to. Autonomy is very important for a simple reason many a times uh, the lending practices of a public sector bank uh, 
or uh, the people to whom they are supposed to lend uh, will be influenced by various policies of the government of India. And uh, since the banking sector is involved in uh, the credit business, uh, they will have to have the autonomy to decide uh, as to whom uh, or to whom they want to lend uh, and uh, to what extent they, do they want to lend. So it is very important for government of India to provide autonomy to the banking sector so that uh, they can take uh, the decisions uh, which are based on uh, their risk taking ability. So these are some of the reforms uh, which the government of India has to ensure uh, to be implemented in the coming days uh, to ensure that uh, these kind of fraudulent practices uh, are not taking place uh, in the future. Thank you.